there's a there's a something very different at play when you're talking about businesses being transparent. Although we know that a lot of large corporations, of course, they haven't been that transparent. But the difference between a business and a public entity, and unfortunately, the reality is a business does have a strong incentive to be pretty transparent because it needs you to do business with them. And if they are totally opaque, opaque about their operations and then they fail, you're not doing business with them. With a public entity, talk about taxes, if you don't want to pay taxes, it's not really an option. You've got to do business with that entity. That's why the idea of charter schools and choice is so important. The way you affect this district and the people who run it or in charge of it is, somehow you have to enable the money to leave it when people aren't happy. Then you start to have the incentives to be transparent. You do then get into the problem of large bureaucracies have a very difficult time being transparent because it's so hard to track what goes on. But until you have the incentives to be transparent, you can't even start the conversation, really, about how do you get that transparency. Who hasn't spoken? Jim? Well, I guess what I'm hearing is that whoever gets pecked, it's all a crapshoot as far as <laughs> job they're going to do, and nobody has a magic formula. So I think perhaps spend a little time talking about the, what are the performance measures by which somebody can judge, because ultimately we're going to get stuck with whoever gets picked. How are we going to deal with how they're doing? Do you want to, can we just go through the panel?
that we think that when you base, you know, everything or 50% of the teacher's evaluation based on how kids perform on a standardized test, that that's not that what you're going to have is teachers are going to be forced to focus on the things that are on the standardized test. It's going to focus on reading and math. It's going to, you know, time won't be spent on social studies and science and PE and health and music and those sorts of things. So we didn't think that that was the right model for our system that we have. We think that we have a better model for evaluating teacher effectiveness. And people can, can quibble on that, but we think that we have a better model. It is unfortunate that our state government adopted, you know, this, you know, this rule. It's a, it's unfortunate that really this is coming from the federal government at this point. That this is now the thing in terms of, you know, the, the measure of school systems, the measure of teacher and and principal effectiveness is how kids do on standardized <coughs> tests. And we don't really think. That's the right model. And actually, Jerry Reese was one, you know, he said that this is not the right thing to do. So, you know, we, did, we didn't go along with that. Other jurisdictions in the state did. I can tell you that we had a, you know, a conference with them, and any number of them are saying that we can't, you know, we are sorry that we signed on to this, that folks are calling, you know, race to the top, race to the test because it's going to create just about every course that we have, you know, there are, there are very few courses actually in which we have standardized testing. It's these MSAs and it's some high school assessments and some core courses. But this program, if it goes forward, will require <coughs> more testing in every subject that we now have because the requirement is to measure growth. It's not just performance, but growth. And, you know, we have enough testing that goes on in the schools. And to really, you know, probably expand it by a factor of 10, you know, we didn't think is, is, is a good model. So I'll just, you know, respond to that one. Sir? Oh, <coughs> I have a question. If, if anybody in the panel has comments about the Broad Foundation, and if you think that candidates from uh, graduates of the Broad Foundation are, it, that's a good thing for Montgomery County to hire. And for those of you who don't know what the Broad Foundation is, it trains uh, potential superintendents. It particularly trains them on how to manipulate the school board. And, <laughs> and, uh, so if I could poison the well against any graduates of the Broad Foundation, I'd like to do that. But again, I'd like to hear if, if any member of the community of the, of the panel is familiar with the Broad Foundation, if you think they're uh, uh, training is uh, is a great credential for us to hire as the next superintendent. Who's going to stand up? Well, I mean, I know we've had people from within Montgomery County Public Schools go through the training and then go someplace else to be a superintendent and were not successful there. Mm -hmm. But I mean, that said, it's hard to look around this country and be able to point to any quote unquote successful superintendent. So it, um, it's, it's called the Broad Foundation and it's um, premised on the idea that our current institutions of higher education and education prepare people who will maintain the status quo and that what we actually need are people who will both disrupt the status quo productively such that we're actually meeting the needs of all kids because let's face it right now if in this country if you are a kid of color or if you are poor you are not getting a high quality education so um, what I think is is worth also just saying about the tests and in a way of trying to make sure that there's not massive fear about what's happening with race to the top in some ways 50% um, of evaluations have to pertain to student achievement, but there's no specificity right now about what that actually means in Maryland. And so it could also be a very low threshold for growth measures on this test. And you actually don't need to introduce new tests in order to do growth. You can use the test from the previous year to assess growth. So we're not actually looking at radically expanding the number of tests that are taken in the state of Maryland for, for districts that are doing race to the top. Who hasn't spoken before anybody that yeah I just have a question um, 
just out of curiosity, plan B, if, if a superintendent is not found in this search process, what is the um, plan to? Well, we have to have a superintendent in place by July 1st. Correct. And if we do not, then we would have to appoint an interim for one year. Okay, so is that part of the process to make sure that that uh, whoever that appointee might be, that that selection or whatever is also well, I think we will, you know, in the back of our minds, think about who, you know, who might be a good candidate for a one-year interim. Right. But I think our plan certainly is to, you know, we're approaching it from the standpoint of we will we will have a superintendent in place by, by July We just 1st. don't want to be forced to take whatever's there just because we have to have a superintendent. You know what I mean? I was just curious, plan B. <laughs> I, I also wanted to, when you were talking about race to the top, Bill, I was, I was thinking some of the very same things. I, I've heard the argument before um, that kind of came out of our local teachers union um, that, that going to a 50% reform um, growth measure is going to mandate that we have all these extra tests. And, and I, I was thinking exactly the same thing. There's, there's no, that's kind of a big leap. In my mind, I don't. I don't really see that there's that that has to go in that direction um, at all. I don't think there's anything necessary about that. Um, uh, well, that, that is what that, Maryland, that is what Maryland is planning. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I haven't seen that. If, if I can clarify, I think the point at of all, confusion, and I, and I might be wrong about this, but it's that when you sign on to <coughs> the top. It's that you will eventually have to adopt national standards. So the MSA, no matter what, you could keep it, but will probably be replaced ultimately with national standards and a national test. Well, I think that's a different question, actually, in the state of Maryland, because we are also signed on to the governor's compact. So that we've already the the one for for math and for reading, and that's already in the works. That's kind of a separate, different thing. That's going to mean that our tests in general, the MSAs, well, or whatever replaces them, is going to change anyway. Well, that's the point is you had to sign on to those national standards. And then I'm projecting a little down the road. So your MSAs would at least have to reflect the new standards in a few years. And then if this gets into reauthorization of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act, but at least what's been proposed in the Obama administration is then that there would ultimately be tests connected to that, which would likely be national tests which are under development. So the point of confusion, I'm just saying, might be that someone would think you would keep the MSAs and have a separate national testing system, which I don't think is something that's contemplated right now. Yes, I'd just like to compliment our school board immensely for not going to race to the top. I call it race to the bottom. Yes, there'll be more tests. Yes, teachers will be held accountable for students when they have no control over it. Yes, we'll lose some good teachers doing that. And I think that we're testing our kids like crazy. I think that we need to stop it. The race to the top, all the legislators had to come out with some little things to please the education department. These were not good measures that they did. This was more testing. And I think that our board was just extremely wise in what they did. And I hope that we have no more race at the top when we reauthorize the law. I have only one comment. I used to belong to one of the largest companies in the United States called the federal government. You had no choice except to be a consumer of the products of the federal government. In 2002, they did a study of their auditable uh, financial statements. Out of 87 different departments, 86 failed it. In 2009, they did the same auditing on all of the 87 departments. <coughs> Out of the 87 departments, only two actually failed standard gap uh, audits. One of them was the Defense Department, and we all know where that's going. And the other one was Homeland Security. <laughs> now, if you want to put any effort 
into doing strong financial management, and in this case, the public school board should be the ones leading it, that finances for the public schools could be brought into more transparency, that the fact is that there is no demand that I have seen from the political side to have that done is one of the reasons why it hasn't been done. Well, I'll, I'll just respond to that. I mean, and now I'm chairing the fiscal management committee on the school board, and we have extensive discussions at every meeting about the audits that occur. We are audited up to, you know, I can't tell you how many audits that are are performed on the school system. We're audited by the state, we're audited by the federal government, we have internal auditors, we have external auditors, you know, they audit our school construction funds, I mean, we audit our contractors. There are an extensive set of audits and mostly, I'll say probably 98%, our audits come back extremely clean. We are not, you know, <coughs> there can be discussions about how the school system spends its money, but in terms of the audits that are done of the books, okay, we do extremely well. And I'm saying we, we have, you know, we you know, we have professional firms that go in and look at and look at the books. And like I said, we, we could probably have a full-time staff that does nothing but respond to audits. So, then why, so does, then why does it take an FOI a request to find out what the books look like? Well, one thing, um, I'm interested in the issue of um, MCPS employees that have American Express cards. Mm -hmm. And I think there are about, what, 1,400 American Express cards um, floating around public school system. And the Office of Legislative Audits within the last year, the direction of the, the state legislature, directed an audit and they found, oh, there's one right there, um, found that the MCPS had lax oversight of their credit card usage. Now, we know that. We've seen, you know, credit card logs where, you know, Central office personnel were taking themselves out to places like Addie's and <coughs> Pizza Co. and Cheesecake Factory for nice lunches and dinners. But what what we don't know, and I don't know how to go about finding it, maybe Phil can share, is um, what practices has the board and superintendent put in place to bring these abusive credit card charges under control? Since the audit, we had an audit finding that said this right. is bad. And there were controls put in place. What were they? Well, you know, in terms of who has to sign off, in terms of the logs and all that, I mean, there there were extensive controls. But they weren't being followed. How do you? <laughs> the, the fact, and I think we're getting a little bit off right. topic here. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, what happened a couple of years ago in terms of some credit card charges? you know, happened a couple of years ago on some credit card charges. So, yes, we looked at it, we put controls in place, and I, you know, I'm not aware that we're currently having issues with current charges. You know, we corrected the problem. You know, it is one of the things that we discussed in the Fiscal Management Committee in terms of how are we going to address, you know, what controls do we need to put in place, you know, for, you know, credit card transactions. So, thanks. thanks for being on the hot seat. We kind of have to wrap it up, but I just want to get in a couple more questions. Ma'am, in well, the blue sweater. One, one thing. Oh, excuse me, I don't think she had asked. Yeah. I'm trying to ask a question for a while. Sorry. I have a quick question and then uh, a comment. The quick question is the school board, uh, as you choose your superintendent, is it unanimous? Does it have to be unanimous selection? Just majority? Okay. Um, uh, and then the other thing I, I'd just like to comment on, I, I really do not understand the, the fear in this county of charter schools and school choice. I, it borders almost to me on paranoia. Mm -hmm. And I sometimes wonder with the, the administration and some of the school board members, um, 
it, it smacks to me almost a hubris that they're doing it so well that there's no way anybody or anything else could do it better. But coming from special education, I think almost everybody I've been to in special education will tell you that there's huge discrepancies in services in different parts of the county. That a program can be fabulous in one place and absolutely nightmarish in another. Um, and parents will fight legally to try to get transferred and spend tons of money. Um, and in that vein, I would love to see the Office of Shared Accountability moved outside of the school administration. That if it's really going to be accountable, it has to be. And I would love to see that. I, I think it's a real conflict of interest to have the system evaluating itself. I think we do have to wind it up now. So um, I'll just take one more question. This is it, Amanda. Um, kind of an undercurrent I'm hearing here implied in the questions is that the school board works for the superintendent. And um, it's kind of a, 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 a trend that you see in systems where there are elected amateurs to oversee professionals. And I would like to encourage the school board, Mr. Kaufman, um, maybe that's not the way you see yourselves. And I would encourage you not to see yourself like that. I would like to see you hire a superintendent who is answerable to you since you are the elected representatives of, of this community, not the superintendent. I would like to see you bring in a superintendent who's not, in, who's not interested in becoming a celebrity at the expense of our students. Now, the second point I'd like to make is, again, I have a, I have a school in my community with 88% minority that does not re represent the composition of the rest of the community. And part of the reason we have that is we have been running a de facto charter school experiment for 50 years called St. Mary's Elementary School up here in Rockville that started because the community was founded by a large number of Irish Catholics and they sent their children to, to a Catholic school, which is fine, but the end result is I have a school that where the parents don't understand how to advocate for themselves and that's a, that's a situation that I would not want to see replicated in the rest of the county. Thank you. Well, I think we have to wind it up, but I want to thank um, the panel and Bill especially, thanks for being in the hot seat and volunteering to come. So if, are there any last words from any of you that, I just, um, yeah, like One thing, I had a handout in the back of the room, um, an article in the Tacoma Voice written by Sue Katz Miller, a brilliant article on the 10 qualities she would like to see in her dream superintendent, and I endorse those heartily. Um, also in the back of the room is um, a report on um, children and, and youth with disabilities and some action steps that we can take to improve um, improve outcomes in Montgomery County if you want to take one for three Thank you all.